What's up, Wisecrack? Jared again. If you haven't noticed, we really, really love Rick and Morty. Unfortunately, we're still desperately waiting for the rest of season three and more of that sweet, sweet Szechuan sauce. This sauce is amazing. But to tide you guys over, we thought we'd put philosophy aside and take a look at another element that makes Rick and Morty so great. Showrunners Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland's mastery of story structure. Welcome to this Wisecrack edition on how Rick and Morty tells a story. But before we get into it, we just want to thank Quid for sponsoring this video. So what is Quid? Quid is a new app where you can collect exclusive digital stickers, cards, and toys for free, featuring all the shows we love here at Wisecrack. Breaking Bad, Adventure Time, Bob's Burgers, Star Trek, and most importantly, Rick and Morty. You know, I was a little skeptical at first, but getting to slap Rick Sanchez stickers on my desperate pleas to get Jacob to join me for Korean barbecue is really fun. It's my Szechuan sauce, seriously. They've made a pretty fun game of collecting them too. You open up packs of stickers and cards, it kind of brings me back to the days of opening up basketball cards as a kid. You can also showcase your collection by adding stickers to anything on your camera roll. And my dog Woody always looks best when he's chilling with Snuffles. And they've got Funko Pop figures too, so I grabbed myself this Meeseeks to serve as a friendly reminder that existence is pain. Check out the description below for a link to grab the app for free. It's available on iOS and Android, but it's not as smooth on Android yet since it's still in beta. Anyway, I'm on there as JaredC137, so add me as a friend and trade me all your Meeseeks swag. Now, let's get on with the show. Dan Harmon states that every story, from the Odyssey to your standard fart joke, follows eight simple steps. Harmon called it the story embryo, and it goes like this. Number one, a character is in a zone of comfort. Number two, but they want something. Number three, they enter an unfamiliar situation. Number four, adapt to it. Number five, get what they wanted. Number six, pay a heavy price for it. Number seven, then return to their familiar situation. Number eight, having changed. Of course, this can all change based on the genre and medium, and it especially changes for television. Whereas a movie's goal is to send viewers out on a 90 minute high, television is a bit different. It aims to keep people watching television forever. Harmon says that this is all to put your brain in a vegetative state so that the commercials can do their work. This means television shows are less about change and more about preserving the status quo. In The Dark Knight Rises, Batman saves Gotham before jetting off to Italy to start a new life. While in Batman the Animated Series, you can bet your bottom dollar that each episode begins and ends with Batman fighting a different villain in the same old Gotham. In Harmon's words, television swaps out any meaningful and therefore potentially television subverting truth with the basic eternal truth that change is unnecessary. With that in mind, the structure of a TV episode often ends up looking more like this. 1. I, the protagonist. 2. Notice a small problem. 3. And make a major decision. 4. This changes things. 5. To some satisfaction. But 6. There are consequences. 7. That must be undone. 8. And I must admit the futility of change. So do Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon follow their own advice? Absolutely. Every episode of Rick and Morty follows this format, but for the sake of time, let's see how it plays out in one of my favorites. Season 2, Episode 6, The Ricks Must Be Crazy. Step 1. Establish a protagonist in a zone of comfort. Harmon says it's best not to screw around here and fade immediately onto your characters doing something relatable. This episode does just that, opening with Summer, Rick, and Morty coming out of the movie Ball Fondlers. In just 20 short seconds, the episode has told us who our protagonist are and what they and their world is like. There's pros and cons to every alternate timeline. Fun facts about this one. It's got giant telepathic spiders, 11 9-11s, and the best ice cream in the multiverse! Shut Whoa. up! And 25 seconds later, the script moves to step two. Introduce a small problem and establish a need. Step two is where the protagonist realizes that life isn't perfect. In a teenage love story, this is when a hero wonders why he can't be the high school quarterback and date the cheerleader. In a horror film, this is when the group of teens first hears that someone was murdered in the woods 13 years ago. For the Sanchez family though, it's when Rick's ship refuses to start. Oh great, huh? Looks like something's wrong with the microverse battery. We're gonna have to go inside. In two lines, Rick sets up the central problem and motivation of the script. The ship's battery is dead and they need to fix it. In typical hero fashion, Morty is reluctant to start this journey. Um, 
Go inside what? This reluctance is an often used narrative trick that helps us identify with the protagonist, in this case, Morty. Morty's uncertainty of the situation becomes our uncertainty and we find ourselves more invested in the story. 10 seconds later and the script moves us to step three. The protagonist makes a major decision and enters an unfamiliar situation. Step three is where the descent into the unknown begins. In the case of Rick and Morty, the descent is both a figurative and a literal one. On one level, the two are leaving their comfort zone and entering one characterized by danger and uncertainty. While on a more literal level, they're actually shrinking down to visit a world inside Rick's car battery, posing as aliens. There's nothing dishonest about what we're doing. Now slap on these antenna. These people need to think we're aliens. Harmon says it's not that important how big or epic your story is, but rather how noticeable the contrast is between your two worlds. This episode takes that premise and runs with it, introducing us to a world that is completely foreign to our own. It's populated by Martian-like people living in power plant-inspired buildings who venerate Rick for introducing them to electricity. Unknown to them, the Stairmaster-like Google boxes Rick gave them actually redirect most of their power to Rick's ship. And like the dick of a god he is, Rick has guided their civilization in some messed up ways. Morty, you gotta flip them off. I told them it means peace among worlds. How hilarious is that? Which brings us to step four. Characters adapt to the new situation and things must change. Step four is all about the characters learning their place in this new world. It's where all of their neuroses are broken down and their psychological baggage is slowly stripped away. Movie producers call it the training phase. But remember, TV isn't about selling change. It's about preserving the status quo so you'll tune in week after week. As such, this stage is much less about internal change and much more about external change. Once they arrive in the microverse, Rick and Morty orient themselves in this new world and identify the problem at hand. Zeep Zanflor. Zeep is perhaps the most familiar and strangest aspect of this microverse, essentially a carbon copy of Rick himself. I dropped out of school. It's not a place for smart people. Zeep even creates his own microverse to generate his planet's electricity, which makes Rick's Google boxes obsolete and his car battery unusable. Faced with a mirror image of themselves, you'd expect a normal character to own up to their own hypocrisy and begin to change. But not Rick. Rick shamelessly parrots the same objections Morty had made to him earlier. A shot which is almost visually identical in the earlier scene. That just sounds like slavery with extra steps. Ooh la la, someone's gonna get laid in college. Well, that just sounds like slavery with extra steps. Eek, Barba Durkle, somebody's gonna get laid in college. And when Morty later calls Rick out on his hypocrisy, Rick seizes upon this as a chance to stop Zeep. This is the things must change part. A new conflict is introduced. Rick must search for a scientist in Zeep's microverse working on his own microverse. Somewhere on this planet, there's got to be an arrogant scientist prick on the verge of microverse technology, which would threaten to make Zeep's flubal cranks obsolete, forcing Zeep to say microverses are bad, at which point he'll realize what a hypocrite he's being. His people will go back to stomping on their Google boxes. This sets us up for step five. The character gets what they wanted. If you look at the diagram, you'll notice step five is at the very bottom of the circle, opposite of step one, where the hero is most comfortable. Here, the hero has hit rock bottom and has finally found what they were looking for, even if it wasn't quite what they had expected. This is the first major turning point to the story, where your character's motivations begin to change. If you want a plot twist, Harmon says to twist here and twist hard. Rick reaches step five when he gets what he wants. He finds a scientist named Kyle in Zeep's microverse who created his own microverse. In an inception-like moment, we travel into a microverse within a microverse within another microverse. Rick sits back and watches in smug satisfaction as Zeep repeats to Kyle the exact same slavery rant we've heard three times in the last eight minutes. Did we mention that comedy comes in threes? That just sounds like slavery with extra Steps. But as Zeep continues his rant, he realizes that his own universe is a microverse, and that his whole existence was brought into being through Rick. In an existential rage, Zeep and Rick begin beating the crap out of each other. Meanwhile, Kyle crumbles into himself with the realization that he's in a nesting doll of universes. And that's the universe where I was born? Where my father died? And where I couldn't make time for his funeral because I was working? on my universe. But Rick's triumph is short-lived, which brings us to step six, paying a hefty price and suffering the consequences. Given that this model is circular, you can imagine that there's going to be a lot of symmetry going on here. Just as step two is about preparing the hero for their descent, step six is about preparing them for their return. 
This step is all about the hero testing their newfound will against the unfeeling world, often getting their asses handed to them in the process. Rick gets exactly what he wanted a microverse within Zeep's microverse. But in demonstrating Zeep's hypocrisy, Rick causes Kyle to have an existential meltdown and kill himself, trapping them all in the tinyverse. Unable to put aside their egos, Rick and Zeep blame each other and set out to destroy one another instead of working together to escape. The two set up camps across from each other and begin an all-out war, completely forgetting about their current predicament. Realizing that they're going nowhere, Morty decides he's better off living with tree people. But it's actually Morty and his primitive tribe of tree people that forces Rick and Zeep to forge an alliance. Which brings us to step 7, undoing the damage and returning to the familiar world. Just as step 4 is the final step before the hero sinks to the bottom of the unfamiliar, step 7 is the final step before they resurface. The only problem is that re-entering the old world is just as difficult as leaving it. Once your hero tries to return, the denizens of the deep are likely to give chase, and sometimes return with them. Using his control over the tree people, Morty forces Rick and Zeep to put aside their egos and engineer a solution out of Kyle's tinyverse. But once they've escaped it, all bets are off, and the two groups rush to exit the surrounding microverse. On a metaphorical level, Zeep is the embodiment of this lower world. He's there to stop Rick from bringing the change back to the original world getting his car battery running again. On a more literal level though, Zeep wants to trap Rick in the microverse because it's the only way to keep his own microverse from being destroyed. In many ways, Zeep is Rick's shadow, serving as a dark reflection of all Rick's undesirable traits and neuroses. Shadows are a common story device, and like many shadow figures before him, Zeep serves as a gatekeeper for this lower world. He's the final obstacle a hero must face. Whether it's Hans Gruber putting a gun to John McClane's wife in Die Hard, or Luke facing off against Darth Vader in Star Wars, shadow characters offer a dark glimpse into what the hero could have been if they didn't undergo a transformation. The beauty of Rick and Morty is that Rick is completely aware of all his shortcomings and has no desire to fix them. The whole episode presents us with a series of parallels between Rick and Zeep, making each look as bad as the other. When Rick tells Morty to run, it's hard to tell if he's describing himself or Zeep. Run, Morty! That asshole's willing to risk everything he cares about just to defeat me! He's psychotic! As a result, when Rick and Zeep finally face off in the episode's conclusion, it's not Rick battling the physical manifestation of his demons in an attempt to change. It's just Rick fighting Rick. Even Morty feels the fight is unnecessary at this point. Don't do it! You quit school, but you still got some learning to do. With Zeep taken care of, Rick and Morty finally exit the microverse, arriving back in their ball fondler's reality. This brings us to step eight, change or the futility of it. Normally, this is where the hero finally reaches fulfillment, where he integrates all the skills he learned on his journey into his old life. In The Karate Kid, Daniel can now kung all the foo. In Saw 2, Amanda has become the next jigsaw killer. But remember, TV isn't about change the hero can never be fulfilled. Otherwise, they'll never desire another adventure and there will be no story to tune into. Once the two return to their ball fondler's universe, Rick turns the key and the ignition starts. He explains to a confused Morty that Zeep had either two choices, go back to Googlebox technology or have Rick throw away a broken microverse battery. Peace among worlds, Rick. Fully embracing the futility of change, the episode ends with the three sitting down for ice cream, a dazed Morty and Summer shell-shocked by the normality of the situation after all they've been through. In the end, Rick and Morty is both immediately familiar and radically different from anything we've seen on television. While the show regularly mocks popular culture and continually plays off the audience's expectations, at its core, the series is structured just like any other TV show. But this is where Rick and Morty shines the brightest. Because while shows like Happy Days and Leave it to Beaver are content to leave us right where each episode started, Rick and Morty uses its circular structure to make us confront the depressing, crippling futility of change. Rick successfully re-enslaves a whole planet to power his car battery, all so they can go get some ice cream. So while Rick Sanchez might not believe in much, the creative team definitely believes in the power of story structure. And if you haven't seen our other Rick and Morty videos, click here or here to check out our Rick and Morty playlist where we have five other videos exploring the philosophy of the show. This video was a bit of a change of pace for us, so if you liked it and would like to see more, let us know in the comments. Thanks again for watching, guys. Really appreciate it. Peace.